In the vast and majestic kingdom of Castilio, the echoes of ancient legends intertwine with the bustling present. Nestled within the bioregion of the Terrestrial continent, Castilio stands as a beacon of resilience and courage. From the regal city of Riven to the enchanting Duchy of Yarmi, the realm is governed by a wise king and diligent dukes who oversee their respective cities with unwavering dedication. But behind the tranquil facade lies a realm teeming with hidden threats and untold wonders. The land thrives under warm weather and fertile soil, nurturing bountiful crops that sustain its hardworking inhabitants. Mountains majestically guard the kingdom, shielding it from the icy winds that blow from the east. Once a hub of advanced Magitech, Castilio has now embraced a simpler way of life, relying on traditional crop cultivation methods. Their agricultural prowess allows them to export their goods along the Hope River to the Nordar region and across the Zaner Sea to the Anon region. Amidst this vibrant tapestry of culture, politics, and magic, a thief has dared to defy the kingdom's authority. The crown of Castilio, a symbol of power and legacy, has been stolen. Rumors of its magical properties swirl, captivating the hearts of both the curious and the jealous. As one of the kingdom's finest adventurers, you have been chosen to embark on a perilous journey into the treacherous unreturnable tundra Conruff. Your mission, to reclaim the stolen crown and restore honor to the kingdom of Castilio. The thief is known as a dwarf rider with a black beard who rode on a polar bear into the last mountains. For days, you have been following the trail that led you into the last mountains, where the thief disappeared into the treacherous unreturnable tender Conruff. Guided by the Sela River, your pursuit takes you through a landscape of breathtaking beauty and unforgiving cold. Each step brings you closer to the stolen crown, and with it, the chance to restore honor to the kingdom of Castilio. As you traverse the frozen tundra, the biting wind cuts through your clothes, reminding you of the harshness of this unforgiving landscape. The tracks left by the thief are faint, but you press on, determined to reclaim the stolen crown. And then, one day, after a long and tiring journey, you finally start descending. As you make your way down, you suddenly see a white stone building that looks abandoned on your path. Players, please describe your character's appearance and provide information that your party members might know about you. Additionally, decide how you would like to react to the stone structure. A human man no older than 20 years of age tucks into his thermal mantle gratefully to protect him from the cold. His chestnut hair is hidden by a puffy woolen hat he claims to have been bought in Quinoa of the Euleria region. At the side of the stone structure, he pulls out his bow and shifts his mantle to reveal a case of arrows. The action also reveals a multitude of equipment strapped to his chest, the most notable being a box containing a deck of cards his alchemist kit. He knows the summoning arts and practices alchemy, though he introduces himself as Vito, a simple wandering exorcist. Burr! It's freezing cold out here. I sure hope that my roses don't wilt in this cold. Says Maria, a pink-haired girl who has roses as her hair tie design and has a thorny vine wrapping around her head and upper arms. She is equipped with an overly fashioned snowsuit that is pink color from the bottom and smoothly fades out to white on the top. An old abandoned stone building, huh? I wonder what it would taste like if I gave it a lick. She asks particularly to nobody. It seems that she is addressing herself with the question. I was getting tired of this cold, says a tall, tan man with short red hair and sun pattern tattoos on his skin. With two axes at his back and two armlets on each side with a symbol of his titan faith on them, a helmet more akin to a mask over his head, a white survival coat keeping him warm, and a simple fur cloth on his waist. If not for these things, the man would be technically naked facing the harsh environment. This must be a blessing from God for passing this harsh trial. Elio Karm, the dancer and priest of this group, comments after looking at the white stone structure. A short, elven nightmare smirks at her longtime friend Elio. Mayhaps if you wore more clothes, you would be less cold, she gently chides. The lithe woman is pale with long white blonde hair. She, too, is bundled in a survival coat and wearing a thermal mantle. A thin sword is on her hip, and a brace of daggers is across her chest. She eyes the building with a calculating look. Nuela in her monster form. Her equipment has no skulls on it 
However... Never, I'd rather be cold. He gave a quick response to Nuela. Don't be like that. Let's go in and have a warm tea party. Come on, buds! Rosemi says in a cheerful manner before wobbling her way into the entrance of the said stone structure. Upon reaching the entrance, the first thing she does is touch the wall and stare at it. She may or may not be considering to give this wall a lick. Nuela follows up behind Rosemi, staring at her, pausing outside the building. Don't lick it, she says. As soon as Nuela says that, Rosemi's petals immediately begin to droop down, much like how a dog's ear flops down when it's sad. Why not? She says with an obvious tone of disappointment. Look at this! It's so old! It looks cool! Look at this old building! Wouldn't it be cool if I left my mark on it? She says, this time immediately recovering her initial excitement about the abandoned stone building. I don't think you'd want your mark to be a frozen butchered tongue, Missy. Vito responds, scratching the side of his head. Oh, you worry too much. It'll grow up, bud. Rosemi says casually before giving the old wall a good lick. Four. As you lick the snow, you discover a metal symbol hidden beneath it. Your tongue nearly sticks to the surface. The symbol depicts a sword engulfed in flames. You can try to gain insight about the symbol by making an insight check, rolling 2d6, and adding your sage level and intelligence modifier. If you don't have the sage class, simply roll 2d6. The old structure appears to be an abandoned temple situated in the midst of the frigid mountains. You notice faint traces of intricate carvings and faded symbols on the walls. Eight. It is a symbol and temple of Grendel, blazing emperor. God of fire, smithing, and dwarves. Rosemi lets out a sharp gasp as she felt her tongue almost stick to the cold stone wall. Her eyes widened as she quickly took a step back. Whoa! Check this out! I told you guys it's cool! Look! She says with even more excitement before pointing out the symbol and the faded carvings on the wall. Anyone know what this is? It seems to be related to Grendel, but I don't know much. The fellow we're looking for is a dwarf, right? He taps the white stone with a finger. And here we find what seems like a temple to old Grendel. Y'all think he's hiding here? It would be wise to search for tracks outside the temple first. Are there any tracks outside besides ours, GM? Roll search, scout or ranger plus int. Six. It is too snowy inside since the roof is half collapsed. Damn, I suck at this. Well, let's search inside then, Elio says, disappointed for the lack of tracks as he enters the building with the others. Let's rest inside and have a fantastic tea party. Rosemi cheerfully says as she follows Elio into the building. This is a two-room temple with a collapsed roof covered in a layer of snow. Inside the larger room, there is a statue of a dwarf with a sword. In the smaller room, it appears to be empty except for broken vases. You can either continue searching for the way you were previously going or take a moment to thoroughly inspect this place. Nuela pats Rosemi on the head. I was clearly wrong. You found something valuable. Good job. She then proceeds to look for tracks. 11. Amidst the snow-covered ruins, Nuela's sharp eyes spot remnants of a campfire and faint tracks. It seems that a fire had been lit here some time ago, but it is now buried under a layer of snow. She also notices something else. The statue of the dwarf in the larger room has been moved, as indicated by the tracks on the floor. Nuela moves the snow aside and shows the party the campfire. It was some time ago that this was left. Without looking, she gestures into the room with her head. Also, the statue has been moved. She still licked a wall, you know? Anyway, want me to try and move this thing? Elio says, pointing at the statue. I'd check it for defenses first if it were me, but yeah, look for a mechanism or a lever to open it. Then let's search for it, but if there isn't, then we may as well try pushing it. Proceeds to search for any type of mechanism to move the statue. It seems it can be done by just applying force, without any check. Force it is then. Elio says as he pushes the statue. I thought it would be heavier. With you five, it shouldn't be a problem. 
As you push the statue, you notice a ladder that descends into the darkness. It leads to a tunnel that extends about 5 meters before it is blocked by a cave-in. The walls of the tunnel are adorned with dwarven language, depicting scenes of dwarves working in mines. Does anyone know dwarven? Or can cast a spell to learn it? I do not. Do we need lighting to be able to see in the small tunnel? Actually, yes, or dark vision. I would like to search for tracks or clues inside what's available in the tunnel. Rosemi takes the initiative to light up a torch and drop it into the tunnel for safety reasons. To make sure that it's not a big drop, to see if it isn't filled with dangerous gases, and, of course, to provide lighting. It isn't definitely because the torches are bulky and too heavy to carry around all day. She's carrying a lot already as it is. Whoa, check that out! Bet I can do something about that cave-in. Wait, I think we need to search this place before moving forward. Elio says to Rosemi and then continues. I think we need to search for any track or clue that shows the tunnel has been used. All right, meanwhile, I'll go up and make tea for everyone. Says Rosemi in an enthusiastic tone before grabbing the torch she dropped and making her way back to the ground floor. She uses the torch to make a small campfire so she can boil water for the tea party. And she takes the light with her. Elio sighs and then fires the torch from his adventurer set to start searching the tunnel. Same search check, scout or ranger plus int. Nine. There are tracks visible in the dust that go here, but go back to the surface, seemingly like you did. So tracks that go back out of the tunnel then? Yes. So they went in and out? I believe our thief is no longer nearby, so maybe we should continue our travel. He tells the others about his findings. But why would he go down here anyway? Could it be that he wanted to reach somewhere down this tunnel? Elio thinks loudly. Wait! What if he hid something in the tunnel and caused the cave in himself before leaving so he can get it in the future? Rosemi says in a sharp tone as a light bulb has lit up in her brain. She also makes an audible gasp, but not because of a discovery, but because the water is beginning to boil. Hey buds, tea is ready. Who wants some rose tea? She shouts enthusiastically as she begins to pluck petals from the rose growing out of her hair and putting it on the teapot. While thinking, Elio almost took a cup of tea but then put it back as he remembered what Rosemi added to the teapot. I think I will pass on that, thanks. By all means, I would love some. Nuela says, lifting a cup and taking a sip. She shivers a bit, enjoying the warmth spreading through her. I'm not sure if he did that, as the tracks show that he came down here and then just went back, probably because of the cave-in, Elio explains. So I think he wanted to use the tunnel but couldn't, so he just left. He continues for a bit and then ends with, maybe if we clear the path and go down this tunnel, we could reach whatever place he wanted to go, if we can clear it at all, that is. You can always examine more with engineering, insight checks using Sage plus Int. 11. Cave-in is about a year old. The whole tunnel was built around the time of the Magitek civilization period. Pre-diabolic triumph at the latest. Very Magitek architecture-wise. Cave-in was a year ago. Beats me if it was artificial. Vito explains as he examines the walls. It is not embedded with Magitek, but instead was made with Magitek machinery and with wooden structures to support it. If it was at least a year since the cave-in, then it was before the crown was stolen so we can discard it being done by the thief. Elio says, continuing from Vito's explanation. Then we can consider this, the thief knew about this passage but hadn't checked it for more than a year at least, so when he tried to use it, he had to leave as the path was blocked. This could just be a regular old temple, you know? Probably caved in from disuse. The thief most likely just used the entrance as shelter and went on his merry way. I doubt that because we know he came down here, and to do that, he would need to move the statue, Elio explains to Vito. From my point of view, only someone that knew about this tunnel would try and move the statue or someone looking for anything suspicious, like us, not someone that just took shelter for a bit and less a thief on the run. Tunnel's a dead end. Where else would he go? Vito starts looking around the cramped tunnel for any way forward. The only path forward is the one blocked right now, so he probably just left looking for an alternative route. Elio replies to Vito and then ends by asking, So what do we do? Do we continue trying to follow him in the middle of the tundra? Or should we try and unblock the path to see the end of this tunnel? 
Rosemi feels very offended seeing her tea not being drank. Hey! Don't take it if you're not going to drink it. Such a waste of good tea. She shouts before aggressively taking a sip on her own cup, after which she immediately begins looking calm again. But it's whatever you know. Anyway, I think I can clear that came in if you're curious about what's on the other side. I'm curious as well. Maybe there's some even older wall that I can lick. Ignoring the wall-licking addiction from his companion, Elio says, I at least think it would be wise to check what this tunnel connects to, though we can't take the decision on our own as we are a team. Then pauses to ask, but just in case, how do you plan to clear the path? Because you are making it sound easy. Rosemi holds her magisphere and shoes it to Elio. So check this out, this thing of magic here, it can turn into all sorts of amazing stuffs, and it can turn into this thing that goes. Rosemi then lets go of the magisphere before spreading her arms out violently, followed by a shout meant to mimic the sound of an explosion. Kaboosh! That could work. Don't y'all know what happens if an explosion is caused in an enclosed space? Vito had to resist the urge to facepalm. We'd be kaboosh, too, even if we stood at the very end of the tunnel. And there's no guarantee we won't just make the cave-in worse. Hmm, that doesn't sound good. Elio thinks for a bit. But we need to think about what to do now as the thief is still on the run, and the only clue to where it tries to go has been this place. Can I examine it with either Ranger or Sage to try and figure out any details about where it may have led or what it was for? This would be Sage plus Int and Insight check. 10. This is not generic knowledge. You don't know. The target number for that is 13. Fair. Perhaps we catch the thief and then ask him. Nuela says, I imagine this tunnel might have led to somewhere he wanted to go, but he discovered it had collapsed and is now looking for another point of entry elsewhere. I was thinking that maybe we could clear the path to get there before he does, but if it's too risky to do it the fast way, then maybe we should just keep following him on the tundra. Rosemi pouts as the idea has been turned down. She is disappointed, not because of the idea being turned down, but because there will be no kabooming happening. With that, Rosemi just embraced her cup of tea with her hands and took a sip. She then smiles at Nuela, who has taken some of her tea. Do you perhaps like tea? Rosemi asks. I do. It's lovely. Thank you for making it for us, she says, smiling at Rosemi. Okay, I will try something. Elio pauses for a bit and then continues. I need you all to go back to the entrance of the building, as I would prefer that if anything happens, it only does so to me. And then waits for the others to leave before trying to clear the path. Hey buddy, what are you doing there? What exactly do you have in mind that might get you buried in the rock? Just thinking of moving all the debris out of the way. In the best case, the path is clear. Worst case, everything falls again. How exactly were you planning on doing that? By the hand, of course. Vito said no explosions, and I would prefer not to damage the weapons, so the only option would be doing it rock by rock, piece by piece. Let's not do anything rash yet. Vito holds a hand up for everyone to stop and quiet down. There might be another secret path somewhere just tucked in here. The alchemist starts tapping the walls and putting his ears close to the floors for any noises he can hear. Listen check, scout or ranger plus int. 12. Nuela follows Vito, tapping the walls as well. You find nothing. The walls are solid. Well, you do what you want. I'm going back up. Vito climbs the ladders back to the first room and looks around. The first thing he checks are the broken vases left here. They have some writings in Dwarven and Magitek with prayers to Grendel about warm summer which is overly hopeful since the temple is in the middle of the endless winter. Just to be sure, the prayers are the writing in Magitek, right? Yes, some of them. Rosemi would just patiently sip on her tea as she watched the group try to make a decision. The tea is starting to get cold. She says to herself and finishes the tea before it even becomes colder. She then begins to gather up her tea set. That's depressingly optimistic. Vito comments before walking up to Rosemi with one of the vases with Magitek written on it. Hey, you still have some tea? All this tracking business is making me thirsty. He also shows her the vase. Also, mind reading this for me? 
Curious if there's anything I miss on this here thingy may Bob. Rosemi enthusiastically pours tea for Vito with a huge smile on her face. She then put her own cup down, which is empty at this point, before translating the writings for him. So it says... You read about prayers about warm summer. I assumed several artificers would understand this, so I gave you the meaning right away. I thought so, but it couldn't hurt to be meticulous. Vito blows his tea gingerly as he talks. Figured it was something like that. I guess this really is a sign there used to be people here. Though, I wonder why they stuck around here. Ain't no place to go, crops. He takes a sip. Nice tea, by the way. Real soothing. After discussion, the party decided to move on and follow the dwarf on the ground. After spending some time at the old temple of Grendel, you continue on your path across the tundra, trying to find the path that the thief took. The sky above is clear, and there is a complete absence of any wind gusts that could hinder your tracking abilities. Please make track check and then notice check, scout or ranger plus in for both. Track check 6, notice check 14. Notice check 12, so we totally notice whatever there is nearby. Hopefully that 10 is good for tracking. Track check 16, tracking like boss. So, with Nuela tracking the dwarf, you follow his tracks that are approximately 12 hours old. You continue following for one day in an attempt to catch up. At noon, with a clear sky, you climb another snowy hill when Vito notices smoke, target number was 13, from the ravine, about a 30-minute walk away. Tracks are leading into the ravine. Please refer to the map. You notice a clear and gradual entrance to the ravine, but Vito also spots movement in that direction, which appears to be several figures in the snow. While this is the most direct path, there is also the possibility to climb down into the ravine, avoiding figures. You are also free to propose your own ideas. How deep is the ravine? Does it need a cartography check to know that? 30 to 40 meters. Basically, you can find a spot for a 30 meters climb, same as for finding, while down 40 meters hiding spot from attackers from above. I have 30 meters of rope, a 10 meters rope, and another 20 meters one, and 10 pitons if we want to climb down. After checking everyone's strength stats, Rosemi would be the one with the most difficulty for the climb check, so we could try and go directly instead, like we aren't even sure if the people on the ravine are enemies or not. I think I can jump down easily. Just for your information, you will still need to roll hide to avoid position one. Even when climbing down? You will be approaching on a clear day. So, some possibility of being discovered is present. Still, we aren't even sure they are enemies yet like 99% they are, but still. I think climbing is an added risk. Yes, we might get seen coming down the ledge, but then we'll see them run, I figure. With all the penalties, yes, climbing may be too hard in this specific situation. However, we have to remember how hiding works for us in case of battle. If one fails, everyone fails, though at least it is just a battle and not falling damage. Uh, talking. Peace is an option. Yes, we could try that, though if we go with that, I don't think hiding would be the best option. Maybe just go directly and ask, have you seen some dwarf with a bear coming from the mountain? So I guess we are going with option one, then the ravine entrance? I guess so. They may have run into our target. Should we try to sneak our way in, or should we just go directly and ask? Go directly. Sneaking makes us look super bad. Yeah, I was thinking the same. Maybe have only a couple talk while the rest hide in case they're not friendly if we want to be careful. And if they end up being enemies, then we know what to do, at least. Rosemi and others discuss the possibility of her jumping down to mitigate damage, but the jump check is only useful when jumping up or across, not down. Rosemi looks at the ravine with pure excitement in her eyes. She begins to get jumpy. Oh, oh, I can easily get to the bottom if you buds need me to. Let's just try the regular way. I'd rather not risk falling from that high. Elio tells Rosemi, who seemed eager to jump down the cliff. But think of how amazing it will be. Just imagine it like bungee jumping, except without the rope, says Rosemi with a tone of disappointment in her voice, yet still so enthusiastic. I mean, you can do that. After the quest, that is. I'm sure Titan will accept you with open arms at the other side. As you approach closer to the entrance into the ravine, please make danger sense checks, scout or ranger plus int. Six. 
8. 16. Danger Sense. As you move closer, Nuela spots movement in the snow. Target number was 14. Six barbarous rush at you with their weapons drawn. They have white fur that blends almost perfectly with the snow. Please make two monster knowledge checks and initiative rolls for everyone. Combat. We will follow the standard combat rules. After rolling, they went second and recognized five barbarous as winter goblins. Leader data remained hidden and no weak points were found. Winter Goblin. Monster Level 3. This subspecies of goblin inhabits snowy areas. Except in winter, they are indistinguishable from ordinary goblins. In winter, however, they are covered with long white body hairs. This makes it difficult to find winter goblins in the snow, and they are good at hiding in the snow and ambushing people. Rosemi immediately lowers her stance, spreading her legs and preparing her hands, though not quite yet drawing her weapons. It's an ambush! Rosemi states the obvious. I'm going to whoop your butts, Butayero! Rosemi shouts in a failed attempt to sound intimidating. And here they come. Elio says, Anyone not feeling it for close combat, please move to the back. After a short pause, he looks at Nuela. You staying? Or prefer to move to the back to spell things up? Anyway, I think I should prepare for this a bit. Elio says as he starts stretching his leg while doing some kind of breathing technique while thinking. To move like a prey running away. Gazelle feet. Winter goblins shout in barbaric. This time, no meat will escape! Stand down or we'll turn you into fertilizer for the snow flowers. Vito barks something in barbaric back at the winter goblins as he pulls out his bow and reaches into his mantle for a green card he throws right at Elio. The card disperses into green energy that coalesces into a verdant see-through armor for the Soleil. Try to spare one. They've seen our target. The alchemist declares coolly to his allies. Are you really going to interrogate a goblin? Elio asks Vito with a puzzled look on his face. Well, at least we know we are going on the right track then. I've learned some tricks after traveling for three years. I know how to interrogate goblins. The farmer turned exorcist replied grimly. What are you guys talking about? These Butas can talk? Rosemi chimes in. What are they saying? Not sure, but I imagine it is something along the lines of how much they hate flowers, Nuela says as she draws her sword. Oh, they've done it! It's time to pluck these Butas! Rosemi says in a somewhat angry tone, but it doesn't appear intimidating at all. Nuela turns her face away to hide her smile from the little rose woman. Indeed, this insult cannot stand, she shouts, bouncing from foot to out, waiting for them to approach. Enemy turn. Barbarous run 12 meters forward, and then the leader shouts in barbaric. Trample! Trample! Jump! Jump! And winter goblins, along with the leader, who looks like a bigger winter goblin, start to jump and shout loudly, pounding their feet into the snow. You hear a rumble somewhere from the hill you just came from. Your turn. I see they are eager to fight. Well, so am I. Elio says as he gets closer to the enemy, drawing both axes he had at his back while moving six meters and then carefully aims at Goblin A with aimed strike one and attacks. Accuracy first attack, 12. 12 or more hits, since I'm using fixed values. 18 to three def, 15 damage first hit. Second accuracy, 17. 12 to three, nine more damage. Dead. First down. Elio says with a wide smile. Whoa, that's awesome. That's some good plucking. Rosemi cheers from behind. Nuela dashes forward six meters, summoning the power of her mana strike and causing her blade to glow. She bobs and weaves as she gets into range with the goblin and strikes. 18. Her blade cuts deep through the beast's fur. 27. Critical. My first one. Sad that is still only half of my static damage mod. Wait, why 18 extra damage? Mana strike? Mana strike for the win. Right, so it was a mana strike. Amazing, you killed one in one hit. Winter Goblin C is dead. Rosemi shifts herself forward and wants to join in the action as she watches her comrades fight. Alright, check this out! 
Rosemi pulls two matchlocks. She then extends her arms forward and forms an X with it before shooting a bullet towards Goblin D. Rosemi casts Targeting Sight and Cat's Eyes before loading her guns with two solid bullets. Accuracy checks are 14 and 13. 10 and 11 damage. And another Goblin death. Hiya! And they call me Rosemi Love Glock for a reason. She says smugly and proudly before celebrating her plucking of the Goblin. Winter Goblin D is dead as well. Chish, these guys are being real varmints right now. On his left hand, Vito reveals an unusual feathered trinket he was holding. He begins saying words in demonic, and a smoke-like aura emits from the trinket and materializes into a small humanoid floating in the air with dark feathered wings on her back. Oh, you let me out. Who are the poor suckers getting smoked? And who's the poor sucker doing the smoking? Vito points to the winner goblins. Get me the frog, guy. He pulls out a live frog as the offering. The imp seal claps. I really don't get why they work for so cheap. But oh well, one news them all coming right up. The demon floats up higher and dissolves into smoke once again, before coalescing and transforming into a huge arc of ornamented double black doors. Beholden to our pact, O verdant toad of the swamps of the forgotten. Vito begins chanting something in demonic as he holds up the live frog. Barely a short moment later, the frog disappears and the doors open. A much larger frog the size of a child hops off of it and right next to Nuela. All right, in accordance with the deal, hit that barbarous. Vito commands. Demon action roll, six. Best result. I get to choose the target, hitting Gabo E with the Green Blood Curse. Success value 14. Willpower half. Okay, Master, we'll be done. We always obey Pax. Answers Nizimal in demonic. It hits fully. 12. 14 applied. 7 left. Okay, then I guess I'm shooting the guy to try to finish him off. Then Vito killed Winter Goblin E. Enemy turn. You hear the rumble from behind you. It's getting louder. The leader shouts in barbaric. Stop them! I will go for the rest! And runs away. Full move, minus four on evasion. Winter Goblin B attacks Nuela. 17. Nuela casually deflects the goblin's puny attack. Look at him running. Wait, what did he say? Elio asks Vito as he is the party translator. Player's turn. He's about to pursue other people. We need to catch up, Vito says to the others. Who is he going after? Anyway, I think I'm going to take care of the one right here, then you all should be free to advance. Elio says as he goes after the remaining goblin on the front line, aiming carefully with his first hit. Aim to attack one. Or he could also be getting back up. But his wording's a little off, and I could just have misheard. The alchemist adds. Which one is it? His imp seal shouts in her gate form. I don't know. He has a weird accent. Just shoot the guy before he causes trouble. First accuracy, 11. Stay still, you stupid goblin. Elio exclaims after failing his attack. Second accuracy check, 12. 17 damage. The thing is still alive. Now finish off that winner goblin, news them all. Vito shouts out a command at his demon. 2. Success value 12. Melee attack to any one character with plus 2 to accuracy from my school secret. Targeting the Winter Goblin. Plus 2 damage from unveiling the beyond. 14. Winter Goblin B is down. Yeah, pluck those plant-hating Butas. Rosami cheers from behind as she watches more of these goblins go down. Vito briefly ponders if he should correct her in that the Barbarous hate all of them equally as a whole but decides that her exemplifying the Dagnian spirit in her own way is good enough. Oh, by the way, the barbarous leader said sullies look like raisins. Nightmares are secretly half cows, and that room folk smell like oil. He randomly adds, hoping to spread the Dagnian spirit. Ah, and the feller also said daisies are better than roses. That's a lot of stuff he said with so few words. It's impressive that you could get all that. Elio says to Vito with a surprised look. 
Ah, oh, I must have skipped over this. If she can act, Nuela will run after the leader and attack if she can. I don't believe you have movement speed to do that. It's 36 meters away, so the only way to get to it would be a full move, but you can't do major actions during a full move. By the way, you can block his movement. If he is within your limited movement range, he will try to move and engage in a skirmish. So, someone could do a full move to him and then try to stop him? Yeah, Nuela would absolutely try that. Just remember you will take minus four to evasion for full move. As long as he doesn't crit, then it should be fine. Worth it. Does he still have the minus four from leaving combat? Until the start of his turn. Rosemi also moved closer with full move to the leader. The leader, frustrated by your appearance, attacks you with his sword. Nuela, make an evasion check with minus four. Multi-action. So, he also casts mind blank on Rosemi. Rosemi, make a willpower check. Rosemi resisted while Nuela was hit, taking nine applied damage. Player's turn. You hear the possible avalanche subsides. And you hear nothing behind you. Rosemi is a bit angered at the attempted attack on her. So you really do hate roses? How dare you? Rosemi then grabs her large magisphere and throws it at the leader, casting Shot Bomb as the magisphere makes its way to the leader. Take this, Buta! Rosemi shouts before shifting herself beside Nuela. 18. Yay! Works. His movement is now 1 and minus 2 on evasion for 3 rounds. I'll also move a bit. Oh, nice move. Wait, what is she doing? Elio thinks, dumbfounded, after watching Rosemi get closer to the enemy. She can't be hit from there, right? Hoping for the best, Elio gets closer to the enemy and his companions. Nuela rocks back from the hit, snarling, before she lashes out with her mana strike. 13. I don't know if that hit. Hits because of the minus 2 evasion. 24 damage. Does it look badly hurt? You don't know even who he is. So you have no idea is the blood pouring from his stomach is deadly or a mere flesh wound. Another demon action roll using marionette and my secret to buff the demon. Six. It uses green blood curse at 14 success value plus two with unveiling the beyond. Nuzumal, finish that guy off. Vito shouts out loud in demonic. Green blood curse damage, 17. Dead. You can roll six loot checks. You see the ravine before you and still smoke slowly rising. Dibs on the boss. My lucky charm gives a plus one to loot rolls. After looting, they got good weapons and unique white hair from goblins and even two Mako stones, five points, from the leader. Oh wow, some Mako stones. Nuela says in surprise. Anyone besides me that is wounded, she asks. No one, thankfully, it was a quick fight. Elio replies. Nuela looks down at the cut on her torso and grimaces a bit. She then pulls out some life grass to heal herself. 7 HP. Vito seems happy with his loot. Ho ho, this one's gonna be a good sell or a good card. Either way, lucky. Rosami makes sure that this buta is plucked by literally plucking strands of its hair and confiscating its weapon just in case it returns to life. Nobody wants a zombie with weapons. That's scary. That's a plants versus zombies she isn't willing to fight. No. And stay dead, buta. You are now fertilizer. Rosemi says this in an attempt to show some sadism but obviously fails due to how cheery she is. Nuela grins at Rosemi. What does Buta mean, little one? Pig. Everyone is either a Buta or a Bud for me, you know. Rosemi says innocently, but you can't help but feel something sinister from it. Nuela frowns a bit. If everyone is ready, then I think it better if we continue down there. Elio says to the rest of the party and then continues with his reasoning. I would prefer it if we avoided any other goblin ambush. Banish check, 13. And I think that's a success. While everyone was talking, Vito finished chanting something in demonic as the frog creature he summoned before was sucked back into the gate he summoned it with. With the demon gone, the gate glows ominously and reverts back to the little raven-winged pixie-like thing. 
and job done. For my services, I will accept a slice of quino and goat cheese with imported Razel Dawn liquor to go with it. The imp says proudly to Vito's exasperation as he lets her back into his imp seal. Like hell am I gonna find that in this wasteland? Let's just go to the ravine. I agree about heading into the ravine. After swiftly and decisively defeating the Winter Goblins, you proceed further into the deep ravine. The walls surrounding you are completely blanketed in a thick layer of snow. As you cautiously continue your journey for approximately 10 minutes, you finally arrive at the source of the smoke. Before you, a camp of winter goblins comes into view, with four of them taking a moment to rest while three husky kobolds diligently work on preparing food. At this point, they remain oblivious to your presence. Interestingly, the Winter Goblins have established their camp in close proximity to ancient ruins, which appear to have structures that extend underground. Upon closer inspection, you notice that the buildings have suffered extensive damage, with collapsed roofs, but the foundations seem to be relatively intact. In order to gain a better understanding, you realize you need to reach the camp and examine the ruins more closely. Are any of them prone? Like laying down or sitting? for winter goblins are lying prone. Rosemi recognized them with a monster knowledge check. Kobold. Monster level one. Kobolds, the weakest barbarous monsters, are 1.2 meters tall and look like upright dogs. They are treated as slaves or food by other barbarous, causing some to flee to humanoid cities. Kobolds are obedient to everyone and loyal to those who feed them. They often work in the dining hall of the Adventurers Guild due to their dexterity and culinary skills. And dwarven tracks lead directly into the camp. But you see no dwarf there. As the group travels down the ravine, Rosemi continues explaining about the butas and the buds. So why pig, you ask? Oh, you know how humans farm pigs for food, it's the same thing for me. Everyone is just a cute little pig, and when they die, they become plant fertilizer, and then the buds can grow. Rosemi says cheerfully. As the group arrives near the camp, Rosemi takes her time to analyze the situation as they continue to follow the track of the dwarf. Oh no, those poor butas are being enslaved by those mean butas. Rosemi says quietly with a pensive look on her face. Maybe we can ask those poor butas if they saw the dwarf we're looking for but those mean butas are in the way. I can glue one of them into the ground. What do you guys think? Rosemi suggests an option. Nuela blinks at Rosemi's explanation. She opens her mouth to respond and then closes it, unable to really argue with the flower girl's logic. Crouching and observing the goblins, she says, I agree, Rosemi. We could easily take out the frost goblins, and then maybe the kobolds would be grateful and tell us what they know. Assuming, of course, that the dwarf wasn't killed by the goblins already. GM, how far away are they from us? You can get to them without rolling hide check up to 35 meters. Then, you will need to roll it. Our dwarf is probably inside those ruins, so we have to get there either rushing through or by sneaking past, and I'm fine with either. Elio tells the party while keeping the enemy on sight, as if waiting for approval to start a new fight. Hmm, I wonder how our little dwarf friend got in without alerting the barbarous. Vito hums in thought, eyeing the camp for any tell of how long they've been there. Roll adventure level plus intelligence. Fourteen. You remember this phrase of the leader, this time, no meat will escape. By the looks of it, the dwarf escaped into the ruins or followed further into the ravine, but the second option looks strange since the ravine ends with the land going up again. Why did he follow into a goblin-infested ravine in the first place, then? Our target must have run straight into the ruins. With the barbers camped outside, it's a death sentence. There's gotta be a reason for it. We need to clear these goblins out and follow him. Basically, you have a choice of stealthy, avoid them, or battle them, and ask the survivors questions. Your choice. Players decided to attack. We demand blood. Death. Death. Death to the barbarous! One of the few things I remember about the Minor Kingdom characters in the Dagnia Guild... 
the party easily defeated those third level enemies that were no match to their five to six level party. After looting, you defeat winter goblins without an issue. Three kobolds that were hiding behind come near and continue cooking and ask you in trade common. Some conraf borscht? Feel free to speak with kobolds. You can also search the area, scout or ranger plus int. Rosemi happily gets rid of the winter goblins with no hesitation. They're all plant fertilizer now in this frozen land. That was quick. Elio says with a disappointed look and then speaks to one of the kobolds. Hey buddy, sorry for the mess. Can we ask some questions? Sure. Vito sheaths his bow and looks at the kobold with slight suspicion. Hmm. He shushes Elio with a finger and glares at the bush. You didn't poison this, right? He asks the kobolds in barbaric. No, new masters. They answer in trade common. Their tails are wiggling. You can roll pathology against the food. Basically, ranger or sage plus int. Eight. Looks fine. Twelve. You believe it to be not poisoned. Just don't eat it if you don't want to. Elio replies to Vito and then continues with the questions. Anyway, we are looking for a dwarf, kind of a small man with a bear companion. Have you seen him? Oh, meat and borscht is from bear. Leader Keck killed him. Dwarf ran, ran, into the ruins, and when the bear was dead, he was long gone. Vito blinks before frowning. At first I was afraid of poisonings, but now I just feel sad about eating a rider's mount. Well, that solves an issue, all right, he said, surprised to know about the fate of the bear companion. By the way, is there any other of your previous masters nearby? Elio asks just to be sure there will be no more goblins. Well, Great Baylor rarely comes to this part of the Great White. So, no. No idea who that is, but sounds like there will be no more ambushes for now. Elio tells the party with a smile and continues. I guess it's time to do some spelunking on the ruins. Elio finishes while giving thanks to the little critters as he approaches the entrance to the ruins. Shall we go then? We're not eating the borscht, the alchemist asks in hypocritical surprise. It doesn't look poisoned, and it's free food. I'll pass. Also, I guess they will need it more, considering their masters won't come back with food anytime soon. Elio says with a smile, knowing perfectly they are the reason the goblins won't come back. Anyone eating borscht gets plus one to fortitude for eight hours. Rosemi treats the kobolds like they are friends already, making sure that they are all right and such. Even serving them tea. She also has some of those borscht. She then asks the group. So what do we do about the kobolds? Do we just leave them here or bring them with us? Good question. He looks to the kobolds. If we leave you to your devices, would y'all survive on your own? Female kobold says. Yeah, our aunt is living with the great baler in two days from here. We will go to her. Nuela eats the borscht, glad to have something warm in her stomach. Hmm. This isn't half bad, she says to the kobolds and the party. Vito hypocritically joins in on the borscht eating, letting his gate imp out to let her sip on some of the stew. Who's this great baler? They barbarous too? Big Harry Barbarous, commander of Barbarous. You can roll the monster knowledge check. Well, it's kind of dangerous around here. Why don't you and your family go leave within the city and open up a restaurant? Rosemi suggests to the kobolds and begins telling them how to go to the city. She even gives them some recommendations from the guild. I see. I guess it's better if we finish this quest before the big hairy Barbarus comes here then. Elio says after hearing the short description from the kobolds. Monster knowledge, 15. Fomer. Monster level 7. The Fomer, a race of giants, were once noble leaders of goblins, bulgs, and ogres in battle, but were deprived of their positions by drakes. They have low status now, but are known for their bravery and command abilities. The drakes value their abilities, but are cautious of rebellion, so foamers are not allowed to assemble in large groups and their children are forced into independence. They often hold command and staff positions in small units composed of other barbarous. I so don't want to fight that thing. A giant grappler with tactician. Ditto. We can totally take that guy if we plan properly and have someone on AOE duty which we don't, 
Yeah, but also, that guy probably won't fight alone, so... I think it's better to finish this quick. So regardless of the Cobalt's choice of where they will go, Rosemi eventually gets distracted by the old walls of the ruins. The desire to lick it and leave her mark is strong. Rosemi eventually wanders off from the group to do some wall licking. Sounds like a Fomor, the commanding type of Barbarous. The alchemist says between bites. Is he under a drake or some other big shot? He asked the kobolds. They look confused. Vito shrugs and continues on his food with no further questions. They're those that can be even more powerful. They shiver. Don't worry about it. I'm sure your commander is strong enough. Elio tells the little things so they don't get discouraged. GM, what time is it in game right now? 4 p.m. Anyway, if you all have eaten, I think it's better if we continue. It's getting quite late. And when it's late, he won't be much of help, he thought. Speaking about time, Soleil's are okay underground where there ain't any sun, right, Elio? Yeah, but we know when it's getting late, somehow, and at that point, my body and mind won't react as well as during the day. That's why I prefer if it finishes this quick. Elio says in a serious tone. Yes, we should probably try and find our thief before something worse shows up. I get minus four on fortitude and willpower after 6 p.m., so please be quick. Speaking of quick. The imp gate suddenly chimes up and points at Rosemi, licking the ruined walls. We probably need some borscht for her tongue. Rosemi immediately gets startled and quickly turns around. She then began hiding the spot she had just licked by standing near it to block its view. As battle axe! I did not lick it! She shouts. Elio just looked at the scene without saying anything, not because he didn't want to, but because he didn't know where to start. Be it the plant-like companion that just licked the structure next to them or the little imp making fun of her for that. Either way, the scene was surreal enough that he just didn't know what to say, so he just stopped thinking about it and gave a short sigh. As a dolorous demon of many skills, I can smell your licking. The imp says as Vito finishes his borscht and hands the bowl back to the kobolds. Who invited this buta to my party? Rosemi asks as she looks at everyone in the group. OMG, you guys suck! Rosemi then stomps on the ground like a little tantrum before grabbing her small magisphere and hiding her face behind it. Okay, maybe I licked it a little bit. She says, peeking from behind. But that has nothing to do with our quest. She shouts, desperately trying to change the topic. So, Vito pipes up and tilts his head slightly. How does it taste? The imp blinks in surprise. What? Her mouth was closed with Vito's finger before she could express her bafflement. How does the ruin taste? Well, it tasted salty and dusty, pretty much like any old wall. Why are you guys so baffled about this? It's like opening an old book and sniffing it. It's so cool! Rosemi explains. The imp gets out of the muffle. He sniffs dusty old books. You blow them. She was shushed by Vito again. That's real interesting, Rosie. So, ruins taste like salt, huh? The alchemist mutters strangely. Perhaps the licking of the walls is not that important? Nuela says as she investigates the ruins entrance. It's important! I only ever lick old walls. Rosami claims as she acts like a self-proclaimed wall historian. You can roll Sage, plus Int, Engineering, to determine the Ruins' age. 12. Ruins are similar to the tunnel under the temple. Magitek era. Interesting. These ruins are similar to the time period of the tunnel we found. They might be connected, just like we suspected. Very sharp corners, and you spot several metal bars. As in metal grids on the wall, or just stuff lying there on the ground? grids in the broken wall. There is an opening with broken metal doors going underground. Underground ruins then? Can't even imagine how big this thing is, even more considering the temple may be connected to it. Elio says, surprised by the structure. I think we should get inside and try to follow any track the dwarf has left as soon as possible. Agreed. Nuela says and checks the entrance for traps. Why don't we send the little Buta first? Rosemi asks as she points at Vito's imp. It's, it's not, not in her contract. contract. Vito and the imp he say at the exact same time. The imp gestures for her boss to continue. 
I can't afford to pay her for scouting, okay? And even if I can, I doubt her reports. Does she look trustworthy? At that statement, the Emmy pouts and lightly kicks the alchemist's head. It barely phases him. So let's just get done with this so we can finally leave this damn tundra. Elio finishes as he prepares to enter the ruins. As you descend into the underground tunnel, the air grows colder and the sounds of your footsteps echo eerily. The flickering torchlight casts long shadows along the rough stone walls. After walking for about 20 minutes, you start to hear faint sounds of fighting echoing through the tunnel, growing louder as you continue forward. As you approach the opening, you're greeted by an unexpected sight. The tunnel opens up into an expansive, long-abandoned large room full of broken glass and remnants of a past era. A huge glass poster reads in Magitech, Ethereum Plaza. You see scattered Magitech goods scattered on the floor and a metallic ladder going up. On the top of the ladder, you witness a chaotic scene lighted up by occasional fire. Three huge Magitech soldiers wielding guns are engaged in a fierce battle with a wounded dwarf that matches the description. The dwarf, covered in scratches and bruises, fights back but is clearly outnumbered. Roll two monster knowledge checks for Dwarf and Magitech, and if you don't want Dwarf to escape again, you better engage. Roll initiative checks. Rosemi is baffled by this turn of events. Confused, she switches her gaze between the Dwarf and the Magitech soldiers. Hesitating to draw her weapons in fear that she might draw the attention of the Magitech soldiers. What? Do we help him or do we help them? Initiative 7. For combat preparation, I would like to cast Analyze on the Magitech soldiers. All three are Dooms. And Doom A turret has 20 out of 30 HP. Doom. Monster level 5. The Doom series of Magitech robots were used during the Magitech civilization period as large scale combat machines. Built with four legs and a rotating turret, they can move rather quickly and fire at moving targets without trouble. If one manages to disable a Doom unit, they will likely find highly technical Magitech components that cannot be replicated. These components could fetch a good amount of money to the right buyer. Initiative 3. We need him alive or else we may not find the crown. Also, those things will probably focus on us after they are done with him, so there is no avoiding this. Elio replies as he takes the two axes from his back and prepares for battle. Actually, we just need to reclaim the stolen crown. Rosemi corrects Elio with imaginary nerd glasses on her face. Yes, but how do you reclaim it if you can't ask him where it is? Remember, we can't ask the dead. One more for Analyze. The escalator can be activated in any direction by a Magitech monster or Artificer by doing Artificer plus in check. A target number is 12. When they are near it, minor action. It will move all characters at the end of their turn in a specified direction by six meters. But we can loot the dead. It's probably still on him. Vito grimaces at the sight of the Magitech soldiers. And honestly, you think we can save him against three of those darn things? Look at those guns. I agree. Let's just wait for him to die. I can safely retrieve the body, I think. Rosemi suggests, siding with Vito. Besides, it couldn't be that far, right? Where are these escalators located? Gray zone on the map. It's not like you will be at the front. Also, even if he does have the crown, we still need to take care of those things. They seem to be guards, so after they take care of him, we will still have to face them. Elio tells the two of them to stop thinking like that and prepare for battle. We can employ an ancient Dagnian exorcist art called running away and hide. You can always run away on your turn but it will go next in rounds. Magitech soldiers like those usually run under simple commands, like perhaps attacking anyone hostile or trespassing into a certain area. And you think we don't qualify for that already? Honestly, I want to trash them to get their loot. A couple A-rank cards would be great. Though I'm probably going to spend a few to debuff them here anyway. I just don't think running is the best option right now, and I think we need to get the thief alive to get some answers. Oh nah, I'm all in for violence. It's just that Vito's genuinely worried about taking on three of those robots while also needing to somehow stop them from finishing off the dwarf. We just need to focus on killing the bots, not on keeping the dwarf alive, cause I'm sure he will, on his own, try that. Also, you can try to use that minor heal on the dwarf if you want. 
Don't forget to roll monster knowledge on Dwarf himself. 12. Genius Artificer. Monster level 8. He is capable of casting Magitek spells and shooting with his gun. Additionally, he could ride a polar bear that was killed previously. And he has Swords Grace Flame Body instead of the Swords Grace Change Fate. Genius Artificer, my butt! Who walks into three Doom units alone? Rosemi laughs at the state of the dwarf. Says the one that walked directly into a skirmish. Hey, I wanted that mean Buta to have my face the last thing it sees. Rosemi banters. He has 32 out of 42 HP and 35 out of 55 MP. Not too hurt. I can patch him back up easy. T. The alchemist shakes his head and sighs. I guess we're doing this. Much as I'd like to have him fend for himself, I do admit leaving a man to get shot by a bunch of Magitek would leave a sour taste in my mouth. Even when it looks like he can handle it. He pulls out a green card and throws it at Elio. Barkmail, try not to get hit. Players have lost initiative and went second. Enemies turn. Dwarf fires at Doom, standing right in front of it, while all three Dooms fire back with their machine guns and cannons, but most of the bullets seem to miss or be intercepted by the large Magisphere of the Dwarf. Dwarf is living his best 2.0 Artificer life using Wizard's Tome Anti-Missile Field and a large Magisphere with an option. I think there is a good balancing reason this was removed from 2.5. But to be fair, I will allow you to use Anti-Missile Field and Break Down Bullet Magitek from 2.0 as well. Your turn! Anti-Missile Field is a 5th level Magitek spell from 2.0 that has a chance to deflect ranged attacks. On the other hand, Break Down Bullet is a 4th level Magitek spell that deals damage specifically to Magitek monsters. Okay, yeah, he totally has the advantage against the machines. Also, shooting may not work, well, I think he can handle the guards pretty well. Elio says as he looks at the ongoing battle, I guess it's better to get closer now or else he will snipe us from upstairs. He then moves closer to the skirmish area just some meters before the stairs. Wait! Vito calls out, but before he can say more, Elio's already too far away. Dang nabbit! Oh well. He sighs as he holds his trinket once again and unleashes his gate imp. Boss, he will wear a wee. Why are there so many scary things here? The imp looks at the dwarf that's fending off three Magitek guards at once. Just transform! With a slightly confused look, the imp transforms yet again into the dark double doors from before. Beast beyond, I call upon our pact. Let loose your fury and join my hunt against the unworthy Ether Beast. Focusing his magic and chanting in demonic, Vito calls forth a large wolf-like demon from out his doors. Okay, now, one, two, three. With his demon out, Vito rummages under his cloak and produces four red cards. Vorpal weapon! He shouts as he rapidly throws them into the air, where they dissolve into a red mist that seeps into everyone's weapons except his own, at A rank. Rosemi begins to panic at the direst of moments and moves in closer so she can cover the area with a mana surge on the next turn. But at the same time, she might have begun to cook some stuff up in her airy head of hers. Nuela takes her beast form and chants to the spirits. Then she casts Earth Shield. 17. Then she moves. Enemy turn. Dwarf reloads while Doom still focus on Dwarf dealing some cheap damage. Player's turn. Rosemi moves forward, placing herself beside Elio before casting Mana Surge using her large Magisphere. Let's see! Dwarf has five magic items on him. That's all you get. Rosemi relays this to her group, or at least the ones near here, so as not to be too loud for the Dwarf to hear her. I don't like that. He probably has more stuff with him that we just can't see, and the crown could be one of them. Elio says, worried about the situation. Most likely more stuff he's stolen. Even though we're here to essentially arrest him, I admit that he's kinda impressive. Vito responds with reluctant praise. Elio moved further, attacked Doom B, and dealt 13 applied damage to its chassis. Nuela and Vito also moved closer. 
On enemy turn, Dume and C attacks against Dwarf missed or were deflected by anti-missile field. Dwarf shot back, destroying Dume. Doom B shot at Elio. And one of the attacks hit, dealing 11 magic damage. Player's turn. Elio reels back from the pain a bit. You damned machine. He says as he proceeds to attack the enemy that just shot him, Doom B chassis, doing it with careful aim. Aim strike one. First accuracy, 15. 15 damage. Second accuracy, 15. I finally got him. 13 damage. Doom B chassis has 11 HP left. If Nuela climbs up too, will she be able to attack the chassis of Doom B? In the melee, yes. Then she dashes towards it and attacks with her mana strike. 15 to hit. 22 damage. Chassis B is down. 4. Success value 15 with plus 2 accuracy. Doom C still alive, right? If so, the Aether Beast goes for its chassis. Tear the metal, Aether Beast! Vito shouts out the command as some mysterious power strengthens the demon. 16. 10 applied damage to chassis C. Rosemi moved 3 meters and cast automobile reading to ride after the dwarf. Doom C shot at dwarf missing, turrets B and C were reloading, and then... Dwarf smirks and runs, full move north 42 meters. Your turn. The bastard is running away. Let's finish these things quick. Elio tells the others as he prepares to attack the Doom B turret in front of him with a careful aim as always using aimed attack one. First accuracy, 18. 13 damage. 16 to hit. 17 damage. Nuela says nothing but continues to work on B's turret with mana strike. 20 to hit. 28 damage. Mana strike for the win. Doom B is destroyed. Attack the last Magitek, Aether Beast! Vito gives off another order in Demonic before running toward Rosemi's bike. This thing ain't gonna blow up on us, right? Only Magitek I fiddled with was the farming kind. Activating Unveiling the Beyond for the buffs to my demon and moving towards Rosemi. Demon Action Chart 2. Aiming for C's chassis. That's the only one left, right? Yep, also, we can't go for the turret unless the chassis is down. That makes sense. I've been aiming for the chassis this whole time because it has less evasion. 10 demon damage. Don't worry about it! Rosemi quickly replies as she aggressively revs the mana bike's engine. Burr, burr! She audibly attempts to mimic the sound of an engine before suddenly taking off and riding the bike all the way up and crashing into one of the Doom units. Mid-air as she treats the escalator like a ramp. Hey! I told you guys to let them fight! Why are we fighting them? Rosemi shouts before crashing. Rosemi uses her mount to attack Doom B. Accuracy of a mount, 17. 10 mount damage. Enemy turn. Anti-personnel missile. I need everyone to roll fortitude. Target number is 13 or take 15 physical damage on fail. Vito, roll evasion against the main battery, target number is 14. Vito received magic damage from main battery avoiding anti-personnel missile with change fate. Ouch! Good thing I used change fate, that would have been a kill. Nuela and Rosemi were also hit by missiles. Dwarf is out of your vision. Your turn. He escaped. Elio says while looking back at his party which was just hit by the enemy. Thinks a bit before continuing. But we are in no condition to chase right now, let's finish this thing and heal back up. He felt how his body returned to normal from the enhancement. With the eyes of a predator and a careful aim he thought as he prepared to attack the remaining enemy, Cat's eyes and aimed attack one against Doom C chassis. First accuracy, 13. Fail. Second accuracy, 13. How did I miss against something so big? Elio says, perplexed after failing to damage the damned machine. More likely, you just cannot penetrate its steel armor. Wrong angle. That makes more sense. Missing isn't always not hitting, just like how losing HP doesn't always mean you got stabbed in the chest. I feel like that 15 damage hit me in the chest for sure. But I get what you mean. Staggering from that hit, Nuela switches tactics and performs a multi-action. She calls on the spirits to heal her first. 
4. She heals 2 plus 9 or 11 health. Then she attacks Doom. Accuracy is 15. 15 damage. Chassis has 13 HP left. This is why I told you guys just to watch them fight. Why did you have to join in, you monkey brain? Rosami shouts as she points her gun at the chassis of Doom C. Get plucked! Rosami shouts once again before blasting new holes in the Doom. Rosami casts solid bullet on her gun and shoots Doom C's chassis. 19 to hit. 14 damage. The chassis is down. Bang! And go! Rosami follows up and revs up her bike's engine before performing a wheelie, making it land on the Doom's turret. Accuracy check mount, 15. Miss. And check this out! Rosami shouts again before completely embarrassing herself by missing her target. Lancis Nalgsand. Nice shot, but he was going to escape anyway and then we would be forced to face these things while he was long gone, so rather face them now than later, right? Elio replies to the enraged Maria Gunner, who just missed her target. No, he was fighting. Rosemi then suddenly bites her tongue from the shock of the bike hitting the floor. He was totally destroying that doom bot that stopped him from leaving, so it's not like he was actually in danger, and anyone in that situation would have just left after clearing the path. Plucking him, boss, I swear! We'll talk about this later! Let's deal with this mess first! Elio just gives a sigh and focuses on the battle. Vito was too busy breathing in and out, still reeling from that turret shot, to really respond to their conversation. Why did I agree to jump into here? Ether Beast just finished the darn thing. He shouts an order to his demon as he grabs two green cards from under his cloak and applies them to himself. Spending two A green cards to heal myself by 10 hit points and activate Unveiling the Beyond. I should have 23 hit points right now. Unveiling the Beyond increases the damage I take by plus two, so I took the full 17 back there. Demon action chart, one. Casting recommand for four MP. Oh wait, I might be misunderstanding recommand. GM, can I cast it after the demon action chart roll? Yeah, it's before the roll. Hey, damn. Well, main battery has a max magazine of one. It has to reload the next round. Oh sweet, I didn't get one of us killed. I was really panicking there since getting down seems like a real pain in this game. You can cancel the action by paying MP. It's fine, a wake potion will usually do its job. Oh, I see. Wait, wait, never mind, stop! Vito shouts out in demonic to restrain his demon. Done. You still have a major action, right? Oh, right. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot. After one round of Doom reloading and group attacks, Doom C is dead. Combat is over. You can roll six loot checks for each section, heal, or chase immediately. Done. Happy? Elio asks Rosemi and then continues. Now let us forget about the loot and focus on chasing him. The guy should be tired. Nuela wipes off some of the blood from her armor. I agree. We don't have time to deal with looting. Vito shows visible pain at leaving the loot behind. They'd make such good cards, though. He grits his teeth. But you're right. We need to go after him. He's taken some bruises at that fight. It shouldn't be hard to catch him now. Rosami looks at Elio with an upset expression, not angry, just upset. And what? I smack him with my flimsy pistol? We talked about this. We aren't made out of mana. We should have just watched him fight and let him burn through his own resources, but instead, you just had to butt in and make us waste our own resources for nothing. Rosemi then clenched her fist and sat back on her bike grumpily before revving it loudly as if to express her emotion. But it's whatever, it's done. She sighs before going off on her own, but not so far that she leaves the group behind. She's clearly upset and wants to let off steam on her own terms. During this time, she does silly things like doing tricks on her bike, where most of it visibly fails and almost always ends up getting her into an accident. By the time everyone has caught up to her, she seems to be back to her usual self now. I still really wanted those Magitek parts. Vito mutters glumly as he sniffs the burn marks. But Pa always said not to cry over spoiled milk. 
and make cheese out of it instead. He pauses. It was bad cheese. As he says that, he fumbles with his alchemist kit to pull out half a dozen cards. He throws it into the air, and it dissolves into a green mist that envelopes Nuela and him. And I'm down to three of the good green cards. Just don't holler at me for healing now. As you successfully defeat Dooms, you find yourself swiftly pursuing an escaped dwarf in a thrilling chase. The chase takes you through a landscape of desolate Magitek ruins where broken metal parts are scattered all around and remnants of devices can be seen, some of them still emitting a faint glimmer of light showing in Magitek language different store names. I need everyone to make an observation package check. 12, 9, 13. As you sprint rapidly for two minutes, Nuela keenly observes the presence of electricity still coursing through the floor, providing a faint illumination that serves as a warning for you to avoid stepping on it. With caution, you skillfully maneuver around the electrified areas and persist in your pursuit. After an additional two minutes of relentless running, your attention is captivated by the sight of an open door at the far end of this vast room. The door bears conspicuous burn marks, emitting a lingering warmth that suggests recent activity. As you step into the door, you are immediately greeted by an awe-inspiring sight. A massive cave stretches out before you, its vastness illuminated by an intricate network of lights that give the underground city a mesmerizing glow. The city itself spans several kilometers in diameter, a testament to the grandeur of the Magitek civilization. You see a pathway that leads down to a section of the city that has fallen into ruin. The once majestic buildings now stand dilapidated and shrouded in darkness. Just behind you of this desolate scene, you notice a dwarf nearby. He appears weary and wounded, with burn marks marring his skin. Leaning against the wall of the building you just emerged from, he mutters words in Magitek. Self close, yet so far. He whispers, his voice filled with a mix of despair and longing. You notice a bag nearby him with something metallic inside. Rosemi is filled with excitement as she sees the long, winding road up ahead of her. She could only think of how fast she could go on her bike in this place. Rosemi rolls up to him, looking all cool and badassy. She looks down on him from the seat of her bike. Need a lift? Rosemi asks as she crosses her arms as she tries her best to look stoic. The alchemist whistles at the grand sight before him, letting the dwarf see him as he holds his hat in awe. Well, I'll be. Ain't this a pretty sight? He tells the dwarf from behind Rosemi his demon in tow is a bodyguard. You sure know your local tourist sites, mister? What were you even trying to do with that? Was it just money? Trying to revive an old kingdom? Making dwarf society great once again? Or you just tried to bring it home or something like that? Elio asked, tired of the whole adventure at this point. Anyway, we need to bring it back. That's what we came for. He doesn't speak trade common, so after some confusion, I imagine someone of you translates this in Magitek. Rosemi offers her hand to the dwarf and begins talking in Magitek. I don't know about them, but I can guarantee your safety, but you'll have to leave your items behind. Let's go for a ride. Rosemi asks the dwarf. I'm wounded. I will sit here for now, he answers in Magitek. Who are you? Rosemi could just pat the back of her bike, then point at the road, then to the city. Sit here instead, and let's take in the view up ahead. Wouldn't it be majestic? Rosemi offers the dwarf once again. This time, she picks up her gun and visibly hands it down to Elio to show the dwarf she means no harm. His gun is actually missing, but you can find it lying about 10 meters down. It seems he lost it and can get to it. That gun is as good as ours. Oh, great. He doesn't speak trade common. Rosemi, can you ask him if he knows any other languages? Noticing the artifice's lack of firearms, Vito tells his ether beast to stand back and not scare the dwarf. Well, he speaks robot. Rosemi plainly replies, even going all the way to casually misspeak the name of the language. Hmm? Beep knock dis boop? He tries to speak Magitek. Stabilize democracy rigor morti. After saying random words he thinks might be Magitek-ish, he shrugs and gives up, letting Rosemi do the talking as he observes the city. Rosemi looks unimpressed by Vito. 
You just said that the square root of raspberry should be legalized. Raspberry root is a famous dish around here, but with a double size, squared size. Interesting. He coughs blood. To know what he is saying, but it sounds like he agrees. Only Magitech word I know is the one for wheat. Rivers. But at least I made an attempt. He notices the dwarf coughing for blood and pulls out a pair of green cards from under his cloak. Need help? Not my good ones, though. Realizing the dwarf doesn't understand him, he looks at his Maria companion for help. Vito looks to the others before using his cards to heal the dwarf, waiting for a decision. As someone technically a part of the Church of Titan, I can't really ignore a bleeding man. You are a good man, Vito. Elio says, impressed by the empathy of his warlock companion. Bleh, I was gonna rush him to a hospital. Rosa me pouts before getting off her bike, as the urgency doesn't seem to be there now. You wanted him dead earlier. Elio says, surprised by Rosami's reply to Vito's action. No, I wanted to watch him fight. I did not want him dead, but it was likely the outcome of the result. When he dies is not of importance matter to me. Rosami says while sounding unusually smart. We marry a live for a long time. It's only a matter of time before most butas become plant fertilizer. Time prevails all. That building was made of stone and metal, though. He wouldn't really be fertilizing anything, just stinking up the place. Short-lived Maria might argue about longevity. Even plants can grow on metal and concrete. Rosami wags her finger at Vito and begins an unnecessary long lecture about how plants don't really need soil to grow, but it's just a rather important way of how they can gather nutrients. Vito listens to it with rapt attention, being a former farmer and all, and nods at her lecture. Dwarf puts a device for the translation of party words. Okay, enough of this. Elio then proceeds to tell the device. We are just here for the crown. I don't really care if you try to fight back or simply run away. I just want to know why you did it before leaving. Was it for money, some convoluted plot against the kingdom, or what? I just want to know. Also, was the temple at the foot of the mountain connected to this place? That thing is still bothering me. Rosemi decides to record the conversation using sound recorder, Magitek spell, but is missing MP to cast it. Rosemi immediately panics and gets on her knees while clutching Vito's thighs. Give me mana latch and cast ass, just one will do, hurry! Huh? Well, sure thing. Surprised at the sudden request, Vito pulls out a golden card and pokes it at Rosemi's cheeks. It disappears into golden lights around her. I can feel it, the power surging through my plant veins. I can feel the power! Yoo woo! Rosemi shouts in excitement as she poses into a super scion post before casting sound recorder. Then, as suddenly as her surge of power came, it disappeared as she spent every last bit of her mana to cast the spell. Immediately, she began to look like a shriveled plant, down on her knees and her body covered in wrinkles as the roses growing out of her began to rapidly wilt as she pathetically held up her small magisphere. A last gasp of air can be heard from her as she shriveled down pathetically, barely conscious. I am Korn, a dwarf from the ancient city of Branch, he explains. Our city was sealed off 300 years ago to protect us from the barbarous. While the surrounding regions regressed to a primitive state, we continued to advance in Magitek. My grandfather, a skilled craftsman, forged this crown and branch for the ruler of our city. However, the crown was stolen by a wizard, Lave, about 310 years ago. We recently discovered that the crown is now in Castillo, informed by our Magitek spies. That is why I have been sent to retrieve it and restore honor to our city. What do we know about the wizard Lave? Lave is an Isferata wizard king who conquered the bio region during the magic civilization period. He waged war against the elven wizard king Aluil and ruled the region for a period of time. However, there is little evidence to support the claim of Lave's defeat by Aluil as written by humanoid scholars. With this newfound revelation, Rosemi is visibly hesitating and trembling in place. Wizard Lave, 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 Lave. He repeats the name, the familiarity reaching a boiling point. Like the Wizard King of Lave of the Magic Civilization era Bio Kingdom? That doesn't add up to 310 years. 
Durandal was way before the diabolic triumph. He looks to the dwarf. What can you tell us about this wizard leave? Man, are we the bad guys? Rosemi shifts herself up against a wall and hugs her knees as she holds her head. We are always for the other side, at least. That's how it always is. Still, I want to know more about this. Something doesn't fit, as Vito said. Nah, it was centuries ago. His Majesty Castilio probably isn't aware of this situation. I'm sure both sides can always talk things out. If the crown was made once, I'm sure a replica can be made again for such an advanced city. Leif arrived in our city as a traveler from a distant land under a false name, initially gaining our trust. However, this trust was shattered when Leif committed an act of treachery by mercilessly slaying a dozen guards who were tasked with protecting the royal crown. To make matters worse, Leif managed to escape from the city using teleportation, leaving us in shock and disbelief. Our Archmage recognized him as Lev, an Nisferatu wizard king from Tales of Old, based on his casting of the famous blood teleportation spell using the blood of the slain guards and his facial features during the spell cast. Huh. So the old king is still kicking? I wonder why that crown of his got to the Castilio royal house, though. You think it was a gift? Wait! Speaking of the crown, where is it? Near him in the bag. You can roll a praise check on it to learn of its powers. The target number is 16. 7. I just wanted to try at the lucky one 1 for some EXP. 12. And you also can ask about what Crown does, but whether he will answer is another matter. Rather than being a useless heap of trash at this moment, Rosemi decides to become useful. She grabs her grappling hook and secures it to the bike before rappelling down to fetch the dwarf's gun. Something feels wrong about this. I don't know what. Elio says and then continues. If the supposedly dead King Lave was the one that took the crown not much long ago, then the old story is wrong about his death. I mean, it's probably just a different Lave who happens to be a wizard. I knew a Lave in the Euleria region. He was an elvish shoemaker. He scratches his chin in thought. Or was his name Rave? Wait, no. Signature blood teleportation spell. The alchemist scratches the back of his head sheepishly. Yeah, that was probably the same lave as the ancient tales. Nosferatu lived long, right? Still, wonder why he left the crown. Out of character. King Mark is probably an immortal king who's been pretending to be his descendants this entire time. Yep. Also, even the guide says historians can only think how he knew about the passage used by Barbarus. Well, a vampire king isn't our problem currently. Right now, it's about thinking of a way to handle things peacefully. Like, of course, he knew he was one. He made it. Probably. So he faked his death against the elf king. He came back as a humanoid savior and made a new kingdom over the old one while keeping his old crown. Well, not really keeping. He just stole it for some reason. My suggestion to end this is I don't think we are prepared to antagonize a thousand years old wizard king. Players discussed a plan to bring back the crown to the Dwarven Kingdom and suggested contacting the Elven Kingdom due to a potential threat from their old enemy. They wanted to let the kingdoms decide for themselves. There was a debate about the ethical implications of taking the crown or failing the quest, with the possibility of informing the Elves if they were certain about the threat. GM, if we fail the quest, what would be the consequences? Only if you can say, though. If you return empty-handed? Yes. You will receive only half of the XP and no money, and new adventurers or someone else will be sent. So no death penalty and everything else should be left for whoever comes. Sounds fine to me. Let's fail. Frankly, I'm thinking of just asking the dwarf's dad to make a replica of the crown. Having new adventurers poking around is still not ideal. GM, what's the time limit we were given for this? A week? In a month, they will send a new group. Maybe we can fail the quest so the new party gets the replica back. Ooh, that's clever. Then, they return to discussing in character. After Rosemi has retrieved the gun, she hands it back to the dwarf before getting back on her bike. I don't want any part of these politics. I'm going back to get the Doom unit parts. Who's coming? Rosemi asks, not wanting to hear more of this problematic situation. Dwarf reacts. 
There were rumors that my grandfather made a crown based on some ancient crown of the Durandal era. Maybe it was. Lave's crown. So he lost his old one and then came for a new one, expected for someone like that damn old vampiric bastard. Your family made the crown, right? Can you make us a replica? I'm sure you know why we're here. I did tell him why we are here. I doubt it will be as powerful. But visually, it can be made pretty close. It will take a month to do. No! All right, I'm leaving! Rosemi follows up. She then leaves her small magisphere on the ground before departing to collect loot from the dooms. We can have a ride, plant girl, just after I'm done with answering. He says in Magitech. They're gonna be sending another party in a month, Vito says as he hums. But it'd take a week for them to get here. And it wouldn't be too strange for us to be late on the job. It's the Tundra, after all. Rosemi just sighs and decides to wait for the others, but she still doesn't want to be part of the conversation, so rather, she just starts playing around with her bike as she waits. A praise check. 16. Wow. It had a hidden target number of 20. Holy shit, she appraised the crown. And you succeed. What the? Well. Crown of Lave, Crown of Haste. Effect, wearer has their movement increased by plus 10. If the appraised check was 20 or higher, the effectiveness of the crown can be increased by pouring humanoid blood on it when a person dies within 24 hours. For the next 24 hours, the wearer of the crown of lave can take two major actions per turn without any restrictions, allowing them to fly with the same speed as their ground movement. 660k! Yup. Since 16 plus 5 is equal to 21. Well, it was one in a million, and you got a jackpot. Nuela goes pale as she recognizes the crown. Maybe this was why Tyden chose her. With a trembling voice, she tells the others what it really is. Luckily, Rosemi isn't there to hear the conversation. Otherwise, she would have worn the crown for jokes. It's an artifact of tremendous, dark power. It thrives on murder, growing stronger with the sacrifice of others. And it's worth about the price of a small kingdom. Yep, that's totally a vampire king crown. Why did you even forge this? Elio asks the dwarf, waiting for translation. By Titan, Vito licks his lips. Imagine all the cards I can buy with that. Enough to start a Yu-Gi-Oh deck with it. 33 SS rank cards. It isn't evil in the sense that handling it will corrupt us. She picks up the crown and stares at it closely, perhaps noticing tiny flakes of tried blood among the jewels. But it would drive most to acts of evil for the power it offers. Also forgot to mention, Dwarf explains that the temple had an underground tunnel to this city, but it collapsed, so he had to take another route. Oh, so that's what that was. I knew it! Elio exclaims as he falls to his knees with both hands in the air in a victory pose. So what do we do? Should we just leave? I at least want to inform the elves if the dwarf isn't going to. Can I pay you for the small recording magisphere? I mean, if you mean to take the recording with you, you can buy the small magisphere from me. But anyway, you still need an artificer to play back the recording, which I would be there for. So, I guess there is no point in buying the magisphere from Rosemi. Still a bad idea to blow it up. That and our dwarf friend here wasn't anywhere near there. But he was going to be at some point. That's what tunnels are for. Elio says, happy as ever. The group went with discussing their next step out of characters. I'm thinking of just staying in this city for a month. Can probably weasel them for free food and lodging while we wait for the replica to be finished. Once it's done, we head back, try to intercept the second party, and get them to go back. And give the replica to the king. Or say stuff about we being too tired to carry on and let the second party finish the quest. And while they piss off the all-powerful vampire wizard, we take the next ship over to the Dagnia region or something. Sounds like a great plan. Honestly, not in good faith to be screwing over a fellow adventurer party like that, but can't help it. I say we just wait for the second party, pretend to ambush them, put up a fight, pretend to be defeated, and hand them the fake crown. Voila! Why would we fight them? We're on the same side, technically. 
Just say we were captured by the enemy and we just escaped with the crown. So it seems legit and won't question the validity of the crown? Meanwhile, we get some vacation on the Dwarf Kingdom. Legit? How? We were sent here to get the crown. It's not weird for us to have it and to try to send it to the king. Hmm. The dwarf is at one hit point. Nobody would notice him dying here. Rosemi would. And she wouldn't stand for it. Luckily, only our most moral member has that information. I must resist the urge to sick Ether Beast on Dwarf. Do it. Fight. Wear the crown for yourself. Don't listen to the plant. Be good as any warlock should. But warlocks have a bad reputation for a reason. Think of all the cards. Be Gollum. My precious. Why no one thinks of the dwarves? I do. I'm just memeing. Apologies, but their comparative wealth came up short. I wonder what happens if I turn the crown into a material card. Players return to finalize their decision in character. What do we do about the crown? With that money, I can buy 33 SS rank cards. Vito seems to have forgotten other ways to spend money. The poor alchemist. Indeed, he suddenly changes his tone as he gets back up. So what do we do now? Should we wait for the replica to be made or leave? I at least want to give this info to the Elf King if possible, as in Titan's name, I have to take any chance to thwart the plans of that vampiric bastard if he is still alive. Elio asks as he picks up the Magisphere on the ground. In the meantime, Rosemi is having fun at the distance performing tricks on her bike without a single crash yet. You can tell she totally doesn't want to be part of the conversation anymore. Hmm. Vito looks at the bustling city, then at the dwarf, then the crown, then back to the city, dwarf, crown. He repeats this again and again, fighting between his greed and sense of righteousness. Finally, he sighs and looks down. Can't actually expect me to kill for this. He mutters to himself and looks at the dwarf. This crown most definitely shouldn't fall into the wrong hands. We can send you the replica to the king, but we will need a place to stay for the month. Can you give us that? Dwarf agrees. Nuela looks at the dwarf and asks, why did this get made with this power in it? And how would returning it rekindle your people? I don't follow. The case was that Grandfather recognized the ancient crown as Crown of Haste and copied it fully along with hidden powers, all those runes on it. In other words, he rolled a praise badly, but very well on the crafting check. What could go wrong? Proceed to make the Undead King crown at full power. And for low agility races, as dwarves, speed is a measure of power. This dude really just made one of the most terrifying artifacts of its era by accident. Good enough. And I think we're all in agreement. He looks back at Rosemi biking. Well, in agreement and biking for her. As he says that, he pulls out two B-rank cards and applies healing spray to the dwarf. Healing spray! As he raises his card, Nuela sticks out her hand and says, Stop. I can heal him much less expensively. Nuela turns to the dwarf and casts Earth Heal. Dwarf thanks and stands up, pointing towards the city. Let's go. In 20 minute walk, there will be first patrols so we can be escorted safely. Ruins are still not that safe. Nuela, can you tell the dwarf how that crown works? I want to see his reaction. Wait, we're done? We aren't going back to the ruins to loot the dooms? Rosemi asks in confirmation before letting the dwarf ride along with her. As you say, you spot several huge lights of dooms in the distance of the mall from where you came from. It seems now that the path is blocked. Did we get his name? Corn. Wait, let me banish my demon first. I think I need to summon a new one for here. Vito says as he prepares for a banishment. Paying Ether Beast's 250 gamble banished tribute. I don't want to cut any more time from Rosami's bike duration. Corn, let me tell you what this thing does. And she will explain the hidden power of the crown in addition to the known power. Square raspberry root. He looks shocked. Oh, plucker! Rosemi doesn't even hesitate to drive away from the ruin and into the city, completely leaving her group behind and only bringing the dwarf with her. She did, in fact, get her joyride after all. 
Throughout the ride, Rosami just stays quiet but audibly happy as she gasps for air every time she sees something new. It took her some time to introduce herself to the dwarf. Hi, I'm Rosemi Lovelock. I'm just a free-spirited Maria, and ever since leaving my garden, I just wanted to explore the world, you know, and make buds and make people happy. It's why I became an adventurer so I can see more of the world. She says, truly content with what she's doing. She goes quiet for several moments, too, before she speaks again. I won't pretend to know what I'm doing is right or wrong. Nobody truly knows. I don't know the right answer. I never have. But I believe in myself and the decisions of my buds who've earned my trust. That's why you should just do your best to make a decision you won't regret. Rosemi continues to narrate to him on her own self-monologue as they drive to the city. In Magitek, of course. It's very unclear if she was telling this to herself or the dwarf. But it didn't matter to her. She meant every single word. As you ride, Korn, who is listening to you, constantly corrects your path, not here. There is a rogue doom there. Be careful, there is an undead graveyard, and so on. Upon hearing that, Rosemi immediately turned her bike sideways and drifted to a stop. Ha! Huh. And I was feeling so cool after that monologue. Gee, you should have said sooner. Where to? It is monster-filled ruins before the city, after all. Of course it is. And there she goes. I think we should go as well then. I prefer if the guard bots don't find us, and for the crown, I think we will have to think what to do after a month. Elio says to the rest of the party as he picks any of the dwarf items he may have left behind and then goes on his way to the city. Now what do I do with this? He thinks as he still has Rosami's gun with him, well it's not like she will need it, right? As Rosami and Korn continue their journey, you all gradually descend into the forgotten dwarven city, which has been abandoned by the outside world. This still thriving city is still powered by Magitek machines that generate heat and energy, including Dooms and other Magitek soldiers that stand guard at its perimeter. The city's central heating system relies on a network of pipes and other methods, allowing warmth to be distributed throughout the entire city. As a result, the temperature inside the city remains consistently warm. The architecture of every building in the city showcases intricate geometric carvings and layouts, with massive pillars providing support to the ceilings. The streets, walls, pillars, railings, and other structures are adorned with elaborate patterns, depicting the rich history and achievements of the city. As you come to its gates, you are welcomed by the surprised looks of its mainly dwarven population. Now, after asking for the fake crown, you will need to exercise patience as you wait for it to be crafted. In the meantime, take advantage of your time in the city to contemplate your next course of action. You could consider expanding your knowledge in the field of Magitek, offering assistance in resolving local issues, or embarking on a quest to uncover an ancient underground passage that connects to Akrof, the city of forests, where the elves may still retain memories of Lave. However, delving into that particular tale shall be reserved for another occasion. Thanks for playing! You can describe what your characters might do, and who knows, maybe this story will continue in some form. Rosemi couldn't help but imagine spreading her buds in this place and letting them be swallowed by plant life. Quite a grim outlook for some, but she's just passionate about spreading life as a Maria. Rosemi will spend her time here in the city teaching the dwarves how to care for plants in an environment like this also teaching them how to make awesome teas. Maybe she will even arouse a passionate resident into building their own tea house. As Rosemi is a free spirit, she doesn't find herself staying in one place for too long. After all, she wants to explore the world, meet new buds, bury ungrateful butas, and make the world a nicer and more plant-friendly place. Rosemi also popularized the concept of selling magispheres as audiobooks, mainly publishing her teachings about how to take care of plants in such environments. She does this so her presence remains in places she travels and that she'll be remembered for the days to come. What a lively place, perfect for some titans preaching. Elio says as he enters the city and so he finally finds a place to talk about the sun god with peace. As for the crown, he will wait for the fake one to be made to complete the mission and then take the recording if possible to the elven kingdom to warn them about the return of the old vampiric king. 
Whatever happens next would be up to fate. Vito spends his days in his continued study of both alchemy and the summoning arts. When he's not busy studying, he wanders the city to see the sights and enjoy the atmosphere. He'd carouse with the locals, but not knowing Magitek, the best he can do is bring up the square root of raspberries to any maids he chats up. But few can stop a kid from La Lumea when it comes to work. Even with the language barrier, he managed to get some simple part-time work to help keep his pockets full. So far, the alchemist is enjoying life for however long that lasts. Thanks for watching. We hope our TTS voices were easy to listen to. Producing these videos takes a lot of time, but I hope you will give Sword World a chance and go on your own adventures.